Hey, how are you doing today, Ed? Good. How's it going, Karen? Not too bad. I got a phone call a little earlier this morning from, from FEMA um, asking me to consider some ways that we might be able to employ remote sensing to help you with the individual assistance and the housing inspection program. And I don't really understand your program at all. So before I make any suggestions, I was hoping you could tell me a little bit more about how your job is done. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd be happy to. Um, we get activated uh, once a presidentially declared disaster is, uh, is made and they uh, declare it for individual assistance. And FEMA will call us up and ask us to send inspectors out into the field. The purpose of the inspectors going into the field is to verify the damage that has occurred to the houses and to do a, uh, an assessment of the damage and then to uh, provide that information back up to, um, to FEMA. So the FEMA can then decide whether or not they uh, are eligible for uh, money, for uh, assistance from FEMA to, um, uh, to help them with the damage that's occurred to their house as a result of the declared disaster. So can you clarify for me just for a minute, individual assistance is um, the money that FEMA would send out to an individual who was affected by the storm? Yeah, there's uh, several different types of aid that FEMA has. Uh, the, uh, two of the primary ones are public assistance and individual assistance. And the uh, public assistance deals with the uh, infrastructure that's owned by the uh, city or community, uh, such as roads, uh, pipelines, uh, water, water treatment plants, wastewater treatment plants. Um, those types of publicly owned facilities. And then the other one, the one that I'm involved in more uh, for individual assistance, really deals with uh, individual homeowners. When they've had uh, damage to their uh, property, um, they can call an 800 number or they can go online and they can register for assistance with, uh, with FEMA. And FEMA has a process to screen out uh, people who are uh, not eligible uh, for the uh, assistance. And that those that they think might are eligible, then they will um, take their application and then uh, provide us with the information. And um, then we go out and uh, send our inspectors out into the field to, um, to do an inspection of their house. Um, but we have a very quick turnaround time. And uh, one of the, the things we really need to do is be able to have our inspectors get out there in a hurry. And to do that, we need to project what, how, many, how many inspectors we're going to need, because we have to put all these uh, independent contractor inspectors on standby uh, for a period of um, prior to a, a storm happening or to a, a disaster being declared. Uh, so one of the, of the needs that we have is how do we um, um, estimate how many inspections there's going to be. Um, if we know the, the weather that's coming, if we know the, it's going to be a flooding disaster, for example, um, and we know the, the, um, the counties that are likely to be declared because of this, um, we you know, can have all these different tools but or, in, or information sources and then put them all together in a tool that will help us to estimate the number of inspections there are going to be and then we can use that number to kind of figure out how many inspectors to send. So we don't send too many and we have the right number so we, we try to, have to get it as close as we can. Mm -hmm. So it, you would be looking at past history, um, population density, uh, probability of flooding, those kinds of things to determine how many households might be affected by a particular storm. Exactly. And then we have the right number of housing inspectors on standby. That how quickly from the time a person calls the eight hundred number and says, you know, I need money for a hotel or, you know, I need some kind of an assistance, what what is the turnaround time they should expect before they get an answer back from FEMA as to whether they're eligible? Well, contractually, we're required, once we receive the inspection from FEMA, to, um, to do the inspection and turn it back to them in 72 hours. So, so contractually, we'll get it back up to them. It'll be a little longer than that for the actual applicant to receive uh, word because there's a little time to get the inspection to us at the beginning, and then after we get it back up to FEMA, then they have to process it and go through uh, um, uh, the uh, ascertain, uh, or, uh, ascertaining whether or not the, uh, they're eligible uh, for the aid or not. So, you know, usually you could uh, estimate probably seven to ten days for the, between the time they call and the time they get an answer back. And as I understand, these payments are not so much to do repairs on, to repair your house or supplement for insurance, but this is more like you need a place to stay temporarily or you have medical expenses or just emergency living expenses to help that homeowner over the right. time period when insurance 
will eventually kick in and so on. Right, yeah. right. It's definitely a temporary housing program. I mean, the goal of the program is to get people under under a roof if, they're, if their house is not uh, habitable for them to live in. So that is definitely the goal of the program. But um, you're right, it, it doesn't pay if, if they have insurance coverage, the insurance would cover their uh, expenses and so forth, then the, uh, the uh, FEMA's Individual Assistance Program does not provide benefits for them. Um, unless there's uh, a deductible that, that they, it could pay for or for some cost that the insurance are not paying for. But it doesn't pay where, where insurance is uh, uh, covering the, the loss. So the point of the housing inspection is not to assess the amount of damage to the house for insurance purposes. It's more to establish that that person has a legitimate claim for this emergency assistance. Exactly. They actually had a house. It's actually been destroyed. They actually can't live in it, and they actually do need temporary housing. Right. Yes. So Our, it's not a structural inspection, so to speak. It's to validate that they have a legitimate claim for emergency assistance. Right. Our inspectors collect a lot of information to to prove that that it is the uh, uh, homeowner's primary residence, um, that they own the house that they're in, um, and that the damage occurred as a result of the storm, and that um, um, and that um, they're, they're eligible as a result of that because it happened during the period of uh, the incident period for the, uh, for the uh, disaster. Okay, so going back to my, the question about the um, geospatial information and remote sensing, um, I heard two possible applications in what you described. One would be helping with probably some demographic information, uh, information about the area that would help you in that planning um, determining the amount of capacity that you might need, having some just general map information, parcel information, and so on that would ha help you estimate the number of homes that might need to be inspected. And I imagine you probably, do you need some help also in de determining how to route people around or where to deploy your yeah, we call that process assigning. We have to assign the inspect inspections to specific inspectors, and uh, that um, that is another uh, um, process where if we know where the inspectors are located and we know where the applications are coming in from FEMA, as in real time uh, data is coming in to us, we then have to um, give the assign the inspectors with the inspections that are closest to where they're located to make it most efficient. Uh, that helps the inspector out because they can get more inspections done, but it helps the applicants out as well because that, that allows them to, um, um, to have the ins more inspections done uh, yeah. more quickly. They're getting quicker service. Getting, quicker service, getting better service. So that is definitely an application. And I imagine that you know, at, in, the in the disaster response situation, um, not only are you looking at the ideal situation of you know here are the inspectors and here are the um, and here are the applicants, but there may be roads closed or um, blockages due to debris and so on. So maybe having some imagery or uh, some image or remotely sensed information right away that would tell you about. Um, the, tran the situation of transportation might, might also be helpful. Right, how to route our inspectors and what, because uh, oftentimes, obviously, if you're dealing with a flooding disaster, you've got a, a body of water somewhere, and if it's wiped out a bridge or access somewhere, then we have to look at alternate routes for our inspectors uh, to travel in order to, uh, to, to reach all of the uh, applicants that have applied for aid. Um, so it's, sometimes it's a matter of keeping people in one location, and other times it's a matter of having people to move. If there's not enough damage in one place and there's not enough uh, work getting done here, then we have to relocate all of our inspectors to where the damage is. And uh, that certainly is a big part of it, is to, if there's any uh, uh, damage to infrastructure. And there are databases out there that the state uh, maintains that um, um, emergency services uh, would maintain that would um, uh, provide that type of, of information that we can then uh, use to help get our, our job done, uh, that being getting inspections uh, completed. Okay, so that's one that, that's in terms of facilitating and increasing the efficiency of the actual on the site inspection process. How about, um, is there any way we might be able to use remote sensing to eliminate the need for the inspector to go, to actually go on site? What kinds of things do they, what kind of damage do they really need to assess? And is there a way that we could, we could determine that a house has been destroyed simply by looking at a, 
an aerial photo, for example, after the event? Well, there is a lot of detailed information they collect on the inspections, um, on each one of them. Um, however, there's a limit on the uh, total amount of money that can be provided under this program. And uh, once a house uh, is, is destroyed or if it reaches a certain level of, of damage um, beyond which um, it would exceed the amount of the program, then it, there is a, a potential opportunity to use uh, some type of remote sensing to, uh, to ascertain that the house is, has already reached that level. If it's below that level, there really needs to be a detailed assessment of what the costs are. But um, types of, of data that might be able to be used to make that um, um, assessment would be um, your image that you're talking about of the uh, damaged area to start with. Um, and then we'd have to link that somehow with the owners of the property because we can't just, uh, um, uh, you know, we don't know who the owners are just by taking a picture of, the, of their property from an airplane or from a satellite or anything like that. So there has to be some link that has to happen between the ownership of the property and the, uh, the damage to that specific uh, dwelling. So that's, that's a hurdle that needs to be um, overcome in doing this uh, type of remote uh, um, inspections. Um, an another um, piece of uh, data would be um, where the, the water level is um, because from past experience we know if, uh, if it's a flooding disaster or if it's a hurricane um, and there's uh, uh, water up to a certain level in the house, we can pretty much assume that that house is going to uh, exceed the, the capacity for the, uh, uh, in damages for what the, uh, the program can offer. So in a really extensive disaster, like I'm thinking back to Hurricane Floyd, for example, in North Carolina, where a substantial portion of the state east of I-95 was actually completely underwater, completely submerged, where obviously the um, Hurricane Katrina situation in New Orleans, where large, seamless, contiguous areas were significantly inundated. And um, if we could delineate a large area and say basically everyone within this area can be considered to have been totally displaced. Um, that might knock out a large number of your individual on-site visits um, fairly efficiently without much room for error. Assuming we can make that connection I talked about is who owns that property um, and if it's a pr uh, primary residence too. If it's, uh, if, if it's their vacation home along the coast um, this program doesn't cover that. So you'd have to make that differentiation of who owns the property, who's living in it, and renters are treated differently than homeowners. Uh, renters are eligible for aid under the program, but because they don't own the house, they're not, uh, when the inspector does the inspection, he doesn't look at any of the, what we call real property, which is the structure of the dwelling itself. Um, the inspector um, focuses on personal property, which would be the contents, uh, the, the personal items that the uh, renters own and so forth. So there's still, there can't be a wholesale just jump to, to that without somehow understanding the, the rules of the, of the program and how they apply to, uh, to the individuals. So there needs to be some um, uh, data introduced which uh, ascertains who the owners are, whether it's, it's a, pr a principal residence or whether it's a vacation home, or whether they're owners or renters. and um, and get all that information combined with the, uh, the delineation that you're talking about that can then um, avoid or, or reduce, certainly reduce the number of inspections that would, uh, we would need to do uh, you know, in person. <clears throat> so we definitely could have an overview image from various sources that would need to be of high enough resolution that we could see some individual features about the house, for example. Um, I would imagine, you know, it's fairly easy to tell if a house is completely, maybe easy to tell if a house is completely gone, assuming there's some trace, uh, a pad or some evidence that you can see that there was something there. Um, but what if there is, we could, for, for example, probably tell how many walls are left standing or what percentage of the roof has been destroyed. Uh, we're obviously not going to be able to see um, the contents inside the house or um, any it's going to be a, a, a vertical view from above so we're not going to be able to look at things like broken windows or you know the, assess the um, condition of the sides of the building but we can tell it's either there or it's not there or it's only partially standing or the roof is completely off um, so we can get that kind of overview from a from an aerial image 
Um, but then you're also saying there's a large amount of database information that would have to be geocoded in some way that we could then create a map that would include that background image as well as land ownership information um, that would help us identify all of those things about the right. uh, about yeah. the individual homeowner that you're mentioning. Yeah, exactly. And where does that information get collected in the inspection process now? Well, the inspectors uh, have a, um, a computer program. They carry a small field computer with them and uh, there's a program in it um, which they, they do the uh, inspection in and the, and the very first part of their inspection is to ask the homeowner for um, uh, proof of ownership and uh, uh, proof that they're, it's their principal residence and if they have insurance they have to show insurance. There's a whole que series of questions that the inspectors have to go through in order to, um, to collect all this, this information. Mm. So this would assume that the homeowner is actually physically present at the inspection. So that, that is must true. must be another yeah. logistic, logistical problem that you have yeah. to solve. Yeah, absolutely. Many of these people have been evacuated or don't necessarily have access back into the area. Right, and if it is a major disaster like that, uh, the, the, the program is, uh, is at a bit of a disadvantage because uh, it does rely on, on meeting with the homeowner, the inspector and the homeowner meeting together at the, the damaged dwelling and, and reviewing the, uh, the questions I was talking about, the ownership and so forth, but then uh, going through a, you know, basically a room by room delineation of what damage occurred as a, as a result of it. And if it's uh, you know, catastrophic and there's uh, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of people that are not available to do it, um, the program kind of grinds to a bit of a halt in terms of uh, the, the standard method of, of, uh, uh, of conducting business. So uh, it's at those points in time where we really need to, uh, uh, to look outside the box and figure out what ways we can um, accomplish the, uh, uh, the objective of getting aid to the uh, disaster victims. And uh, that can include uh, tracking down where they are in shelters um, and when they collect their information from the registration intake, uh, trying to send inspectors there who then can then possibly go to the dwelling and, and, and view it. Um, but if it's, a, if it's an area where there's a lot of damage, um, I mean, it's so catastrophic, like you were explaining, like there's uh, just a foundation left or something, uh, and we can just get that matchup of, uh, of data to, to prove ownership, um, then and where the people are to send them their, their aid to, because obviously they don't have a, a mailbox any longer at, at their property, um, then, um, then the, the remote uh, uh, inspection or remote imaging to help with the inspections is certainly a good, uh, uh, good idea. And if we had, so if we had imagery available and we were able to delineate um, or categorize you know, total catastrophic damage, um, significant, you know, Basically, the house, there's something left of the house, but it's uninhabitable. Versus, this is probably could be repaired. We could make those categorizations or delineations and provide that as some information. Maybe as the claims are coming in, um, and you're getting addresses and information from people at the inspectors or the people um, assigning the inspectors could be looking at an aerial photo at the same time. It might. Could that possibly streamline the process? Um, yeah, um, certainly could. If there was uh, um, that kind of information all came together at the same time. And would... they could somehow submit this um, their proof of ownership or proof of primary residence as part of the application process. Right. Mm. So it sounds like overall incorporating these technologies into the current day-to-day operations or way of doing business is, is going to be somewhat challenging. Uh, definitely. There's uh, definitely some obstacles we'll have to overcome to do it, but um, as, as technology improves over the years, I would anticipate that that's uh, going to become a little easier to do, and uh, maybe the data on home ownership is going to be a little easier to, uh, uh, to get from a database instead of having to get it, uh, you know, the inspectors asking to see their, their uh, deed or their <laughs> insurance policy or whatever it is to prove the, the ownership. Um, so I, I think that there is um, a lot of opportunity uh, for uh, looking at technology to, uh, to certainly improve it. Another area we're looking at uh, technology to, to help improve is, is our training, because we train these inspectors when there's not a disaster. We go throughout the United States, different places, and train them. Um, so if we have uh, you know, geo-coded data for their, their addresses where they, uh, they live, 
and they've gone through our basic training, but we want to keep them around, even though there's not been a lot of disasters, we want to have them go through an advanced training. We can then uh, do a search uh, geographically for um, a central location that would be good to, to get a group of inspectors that could all come to one place to do advanced training. So there's, a, there's another application there, I think, that could uh, uh, help us out with, uh, um, you know, get, getting more training for our inspectors to make the process, again, more efficient once they do hit the ground. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that occurs to me as you're describing some of this information about property ownership becoming more easily, readily available, uh, this must raise some questions of privacy in terms of values of homes or the status of a particular homeowner. Uh, is there a need to is some of the information that you collect considered private and is there a need to, to provide security for that information? Yeah, we do. We have to, um, to have an uh, IT security plan as part of our um, uh, contract with FEMA and uh, we do have to protect the data that, uh, that is collected. We try to minimize the, um, the amount of, of personal data um, that actually goes um, down to the inspectors and then goes back up to FEMA. Um, and some of that personal information um, on income and social security numbers and so forth is all kept at FEMA, so we don't see that information out in the field. That's one of the ways we try to avoid that issue of privacy, but, uh, um, but certainly it is something we, we do take seriously, and we, uh, uh, we instruct all of our inspectors that this information is um, confidential, that they're supposed to treat it as such, and uh, uh, we, we make sure that we uh, uh, treat it as we're supposed to. <clears throat> Well, thanks a lot, Ed. I really appreciate you taking the time to help me out with this today. And okay. hopefully we can come up with some ways to make your program more efficient. Great. I look forward to it.